I have to say, Minister, I think it's quite poignant in some ways that we're moving this legislation on the afternoon that we discussed the Victims' Rights Bill and the transcribing of that legislation into Irish law. Because what we're talking about here are victims, people who underwent traumatic, violent, sexual and mental abuse inside our state institutions. The experience of that abuse, which has many cases contributed to lifelong damage in terms of mental health and general well-being of those survivors. And as a consequence of the terrible wrong that was done to those people, some of them joining us in the gallery here tonight, the religious con in, uh, congregations who ran those institutions were uh, directed to give £110 million in a fund for survivors, getting off very lightly considering the damage that was done and to expect those victims to have to go cap in hand and beg to access that money which in no way compensated for the damage that was done to them but was supposed to in some ways alleviate uh, the problems that they experienced in those institutions is simply not good enough. And the reason why this is bill is before the House today is because of the experience of the survivors of that abuse in terms of their treatment during the application process itself, but also the limitations of the schemes. Now, I remember when this fund was brought into being in the first place, and many TDs expressed, and survivor groups expressed deep concern uh, about the way it was being set up, the board that was there, that it wasn't an efficient or appropriate way to meet the needs of survivors, that instead of being survivor-focused and survivor-led, it essentially became a process, bureaucratic blocks on people trying to access services. And unfortunately, I think that that process made already traumatised people feel like they were begging or being judged for something that was actually their entitlement. And when that bill went in, we were told, but sure, look at Give us the benefit of the doubt. Let's see how it gets up and running. And sure, we'll build a review into it. And if it's not going well, we can always take on board the problems and deal with it then. But you see, the problem with that is that the review was never initiated. Now, con coincidentally, actually, after two years of asking your predecessors, Minister Quinn and Minister Jan O'Sullivan, about where were the terms of reference for this review, I kept being told, oh, we're nearly here, we'll be looking at it now, sure, it will be with us soon. But strangely enough, actually, the week that this bill was selected, surprise, surprise, the terms of reference were eventually published on your website, Minister. And I have to say, uh, reading them, you'd be kind of wondering, well, what were you waiting for? Because they don't really display monumental amounts of work or effort. And the only conclusion you'd really read from reading the terms of reference is that your, the department obviously hasn't a clue in terms of what's going on with the survivors at the moment, because the terms of reference talks about consulting with stakeholders and looking at the eligibility criteria. And none of the survivor groups, or indeed the residents, have any confidence in the review. It doesn't address many of the concerns that were raised with them, or indeed those concerns that I raised with when I wrote to you earlier, uh, or towards the end of last year about the scheme, and indeed the concerns of the Karanua appeals officer, who's had a direct experience in how the scheme is being run. So for Fianna Fáil to suggest, in the amendment that's been put forward, that we should put this off again, for another eight months is insulting, as far as I'm concerned, to the applicants who've already been left hanging by Karen Nua, because the opinion of the survivors has already been sought and the work has already been done. And not just in terms of the work that went into this bill, which is devised with the input of the survivors, but particularly, I think, the input from people like Fiona Fox, who has worked with many of their survivors, commissioned detailed reports, has done excellent work in preparation with Senator Lynn Ruan for presentations to the Education Committee in terms of the functioning of uh, Karanua. We know that they're also going to be before the PAC and so on, but particularly the input of the Appeals Officer, who in 2015... Uh, uh, put his adjudication on the administration of that fund. The answer is already there 
in terms of what you need to do to help the survivors that are there. He reported a 110 per cent increase in the number of appeals. He talked about many of these appellants raised issues about the manner in which their applications had been processed by Karen Nua. He highlighted that the booklet and the application formed raised expectations about what people could apply for, which were not then matched by their personal experience or treatment when they went to make an individual application. He went on to say that many people uh, complained about frustratingly long delays in getting a written answer from Karen Nua refusing their application, which meant they couldn't launch an appeal, while others went through uh, lengthy procedures which required them to get several quotations, for example in terms of home improvements and so on, along with professional evidence, only to be told many months later that their application didn't meet the criteria. So why put them through all that? So his report very much highlighted what you need to do. He did the review, if you like, for you, uh, and his concerns reflected survivors' experience, which again reflects what I've put into this bill. The time it takes to process applications, the time it takes to forward on decision letters, the lack of clarity in the guidelines, the decision to prioritise first-time applicants, lengthy procedures to further delays is absolutely insulting. The difficulty that people have had in accessing or engaging with Cara Nua advisors and the need to expand the range of services. Now, the Department's terms of reference for the review that is presently underway, and I'm sure you're going to tell us, oh, wait for the review, we don't need this legislation, but your review and Fianna Fáil's amendment don't actually take into account any of those things. All that they do is serve to kick the can down the road and avoid further and drag out further the genuine concerns of the survivor groups. Now, what is needed was a simple scheme that was clear, quick, easy to access, easy to, to use. Limited bureaucracy, as many of the victims have a poor education because of their abuse, and they find bureaucracy daunting and difficult to negotiate, uh, and in actual fact, the lack of respect and dignity that they've been treated with has undoubtedly re-victimised and re-traumatised many of these people. And the problem with Karanua was there from the start. The provisions to supposedly help victims were already established into categories of health, education, housing and training. And basically then, people were asked to queue up to access any of these experiences. And I have to say, uh, services, it's been a demeaning experience for many of them. The testimony is there and it's heartbreaking to read when you consider what's already been done to these people and most of the groups will tell you there was no meaningful consultation with them about the devising of those uh, categories and they fall well short of the needs of the victims. We have to look at the issue of the age profile. At this age of people's lives in their 60s or 70s, they don't need education and training. The distribution of the funds reflect this. Many have sought assistance in housing, particularly to deal with mortgage and, uh, 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 and rent problems. And I mean, what's the point in giving someone a cooker if they can't afford to put a roof over their head and meet their payments? So, we can't have a one-fit-for-all uh, solution. We've got to take into account the different experiences of uh, people. And I think many of the survivors would make the point that because of the traumatic experiences that they underwent, it had a knock-on effect on their own children, that they weren't able then to provide as best they could for their own children, and their right to have their own children included, because these children were not unaffected by the abuse that happened to their parents. And it really should be up to the victims to decide what best the supports are that they would need. And many of these people want to contribute to assisting their children and feel that that would be a more beneficial use of the funds. Now, I think we have to reiterate loud and clear, Karanua is not a charity. It's one of a series of state initiatives designed to acknowledge and compensate for the harm done to people who experienced abuse as children in ins educational institutions and facilities in this state. This fund is owed to these people. It is their fund. And, you know, the customer charter talks about treating people courteously, giving clear information, giving feedback and so on. That has not been the experience of people. Karen Newell calls them customers. 
They're not customers. A customer is somebody who buys a good or service from a shop or a business. These are people who were illegally incarcerated by the state and during that incarceration were victimised and abused such that the Taoiseach had to apologise to them. They represent and are the victims of systemic failure of the state and really they need to be heard in this situation. And I have to say the general approach adopted by the state to victims is absolutely reprehensible. We saw it in the Harding Clark report on symphysiotomy. We see it in what's going on in the courts with pursuing victims of the Magdalene laundries, the women who were, had their children forcibly removed from them, and so on. Absolutely reprehensible. And this type of approach will come back to haunt us, and it's the type of approach that's here uh, before us in the administration of the scheme as it now stands. Now, our bill is simple, it's straightforward, it's based on the experience of the people who need to access that fund. And it has done the job of your review for you already. There are essentially what it is are six amendments to the 2012 legislation. They're all practical and they're all based on victim and survivor experiences. And they reflect and address the concerns that those people have addressed. The first one is a, an amendment to Section 3 of the 2012 Act, and it seeks to address the question of eligibility, to widen eligibility to those who missed out previously. We know, actually, that the 2015 report of the appeals officer also recommends this change when he said the circumstances of such individuals can be equally as harrowing as those of applicants who were eligible. And again, as I mentioned in my previous report, it is particularly harsh and unfair to deny, without exception, all persons who have not received awards uh, the opportunity to benefit from this fund. So that's an anomaly which must be addressed. People who didn't previously get a settlement should be, be uh, included if they were the victims of abuse in these institutions. The second amendment is to say Section 8 of the 2012 Act to broaden the services to include um, costs associated with the funerals of a spouse and other services that would improve living uh, conditions uh, to allow survivors pay for education courses for their children and so on. And again, the appeals officer recommends that the scheme would be amended to provide for this. It also deletes the impediment to apply for funds to be put towards mortgage or rent. As I said, it's a bit ridiculous having funds to buy a cooker if you can't have assistance to keep a roof over your head and most of the appeals last year were in relation to that area. Now I know there's been a certain relaxing in terms of funerals and that but not enough and there's no harm in including it in this. The third amendment is to section 9 and it's to provide uh, to include a clause that takes into account the age of victims when considering applications. One of the huge problems here is the delays. Some people are experiencing deteriorating health uh, they're getting older, their age needs to be a factor in a speedy processing of their application. This, would also, uh, this amendment also lifts the limits and the capping that have been put on. And the fourth and fifth amendments to section 20 and 22 are simply designed to speed up contact and replies to survivors when decisions have been made and when a decision on an appeal is made. Delays and poor communication have been a huge a complaint from people. I have so many examples, I'll maybe deal with some of them in the sum of, of people being dragged through the process at enormous length, being left in the dark as regards where their application is at. Those delays have been consistently highlighted by the appeals officer in his annual report and they are a source of enormous stress. So that is a ready uh, amendment. And the last uh, amendment is dealing about this, removing the surplus of the fund going to the children's hospital. And I have no problem with the children's hospital being funded, but I have a huge problem with the surplus if there was going to be one, which is the money owed and belonging to the survivors of this being given to what a project that should be funded by the taxpayer. So this is simple, Minister. I've no doubt you're going to tell me the review is there. Wait for it. We were told that 
when we raised the concerns when this legislation was initially passed almost five years ago. The review has been delayed, the work has been done by others, the needs of the people are obvious. They are the ones best placed to tell you what this scheme should be. And I think given their age, given what they have been subjected to by this state, it is insulting and demeaning to expect them to wait any longer when we can move this legislation forward, which can make an immediate uh, assistance to uh, allowing them access their money for the abuse that they suffered at the hands of a negligent state, which actually owes them an apology and a hell of a lot more than the paltry scheme that they have before them. Thanks, Kim Corla. I suppose, first out, Minister, it is appreciated that, again in this House, the pain and damage done to children in the care of the state by the church and the state, that these people suffered a great wrong. And it is appreciated that we have the chance to say that here again. But do you know what? In some ways, people have kind of moved on from that. How we got there is a horrible part of our dark history, which is sadly still here in many different aspects. But what we're trying to deal with now is how can we remedy that? We obviously can't. We can't undo the damage that has caused with these and remained with these people all of their lives. But we can help to make things a little bit better in the future. And one of the problems here is that the system that has been put in place to deal with that wrong to redress some of it and allow people access necessary report has actually become itself an institution for re-traumatising and re-victimising people. And if nothing else is done here, a very clear signal from every single person who spoke here is that that has to stop. And what Karanua has been doing to people is unacceptable for a public body funded uh, to treat victims in this way is utterly appalling and that message has to go out loud and clear. Now, in terms of the bill itself, Minister, you really only had one objection and a bit of an excuse. That's what I'd call it. And neither of them actually stock up whatsoever. Because your first point that you seemed to dwell on was, well, you'd be concerned about opening an avalanche that if we put in the First Amendment I had to allow people who missed out on the redress to apply that we be opening the floodgates. Now that actually scientifically doesn't stack up because of the age profile of the groups involved. If you look at even the numbers who did get that redress, many of them haven't applied to this scheme. So the idea that you're going to get tens of thousands of others are absolutely not the case. We're dealing with the small numbers of people who are still surviving, who missed out because they didn't know or they were out of the country or whatever. There was a small issue. The abuse can be improved. A handful of cases. But that said, if that's your only problem, let's take it out. Bring it into committee and proceed with the other reforms because that's only one amendment of six that this bill is. So we could still progress with the five and immediately improve the situation for the people involved. So I put that to you in advance of the vote on this uh, next Thursday because I do think that's a little bit disingenuous to say that because it's only one aspect and I don't think it's in any way lead to the problems that you would say that it would. But if you really felt that, we could deal with that later on. I think the other point is the issue... Uh, and again, of course, that point goes to Fianna Fáil as well, who, who could maybe reconsider also on that basis, as that was the objection that they also uh, raised. I think also, Minister, you, you, the other point that you sort of dwelt on, the half objection, was that the review was underway. Uh, give us more time is one point you said. Now, another point was that, well, you couldn't have done the review any earlier. You wouldn't have had enough to go on. Well, that's just wrong. And I mean, Deputy Nolan made that point clearly. The legislation built in provision for a review well in advance of now. That review should have been conducted years ago, and legislatively it should have been. And every time I raised this issue with your predecessors, with Minister Quinn, with Minister O'Sullivan, the answer I got wasn't that, ah, well, we need to get more data. It was, it will be done. It will be done later this year. It will be done in the coming months. It's under review. We're looking at bringing the terms of reference. And we were kind of thinking, this is going to be the terms of reference of the century. This must be a huge thing with monumental provisions in it. And we get this one-page thing, which has a lot of blurb and, and two lines in it. Like, I mean, that was certainly something not really worth waiting for. 
And in terms of asking for more time, we have to be honest about it and not being blunt. But time is something that some of the people accessing this scheme don't have. So we have to move with urgency, and I would appeal to the deputies to take those points on board. Now, again, I do think that it's very significant that Karen Nua has been uh, loudly criticised from every side of the House. And I want to just read an email that I got from a man, Keats, this week, where he says, I have pleaded for help from them from the offset, and they have given me no help to date. They ignored me to the point where I nearly took my life. All I want is the help they said they'd give me in the booklet that I received in February 2016. It said I'd be treated with respect and dignity. I have not been. And then I get a letter in September 2016 that I'm being accepted, but don't contact them. An advisor will be in touch in the next 18 to 20 weeks. That time has passed. I contacted them again to be told I'd be waiting for much, much longer that same time again, that they were only on June's cases. I emailed them telling them my frustration. I feel I'm being abused all over again because of the treatment for Karanua. All I want is a normal, happy life with my past healed. And sadly, Keith isn't the only one. A woman was in touch with my office last year. She sent us her correspondence from May, the start of May 2015. She told her case would be processed in September 2015. She patiently waited until January 2016. Then she was told they couldn't give her a time frame. She wrote again, August 2016 now, and she was told by a different administrator uh, that they couldn't tell her when they, when they would deal with it. So my office got on to her and asked her to give them a clear answer. The clear answer was that it's not going to be processed until mid-2017. That's the delays that's been talking about, a complete runaround. It's wholly unacceptable. And one of the reasons was they said, Asher, we're dealing with first-time applicants. That's why it's so long. But Keith, who I mentioned at the start, is a first-time applicant, and he's not getting uh, dealt with in terms of his case. And the decision to prioritise new applicants was taken without consultation with the survivor groups, and many applicants were even unaware of it. I mean, they get this letter saying, as you know, you've already received significant support from Karanua since you first applied. We're delighted we've been able to respond to your needs and we hope you'll continue to enjoy the benefits. But we now consider your application completed. A thousand of these letters were sent out. People were told on the phone that they'd reached the cut-off point, that there were other people in front of them, that their quota had been reached. Cara Nua does not have the discretion to process some applications and to not process others. That's a fact. They don't have that power. The appeals officer report, if you like, questions this approach when he says, while I understand Karanua's desire to ensure that the fund is distributed as widely as possible among eligible applicants, it is obliged to do this in a manner which is consistent with its statutory remit as provided in the Residential Institution Statutory Fund Act 2012. The essence of their statutory remit is to assess individual applications for approved services by reference to the provisions of the Act and the published criteria, and in the case of unsuccessful applicants, to inform them of the reasons why their application was unsuccessful and how they go about lodging a repeal. That's it. That is their statutory remit, and they have failed appallingly, and they have breached their statutory remit by putting in this prioritisation scheme, which they actually had no legal right to bring in in the first place. Look, I think other deputies have made strong points about the serious concerns that are out there, that have been made by everybody, that have been made by the appeals officer, and frankly, I'm glad to hear that have been echoed by you, Minister, because I realise you're only new uh, in this brief. But this can't go on. If we're really serious when we say that we're sorry for the damage that we did people in the past, then we can't undo that. But we can actually correct the way they're being treated now. And that can start tomorrow with a very strong 
communicate from your department to the offices of Karen Nua that the way they've been treating people, forcing them to act like beggars, not giving them clear, accurate, consistent information is not on in this day and age and that those who continue to do that will be held accountable for it because it's not public service, that's public disservice and nobody should be exposed to that, not least the people who deserve our help the most. So I think the government and Fianna Fáil should have a strong think about this before the vote next week. The objections that you've raised can be addressed by progressing this bill to second stage and if you think the numbers issue is still a problem at that stage, well, we'll take that out and we'll proceed with the rest. But we need to go forward on this. It's not good enough to say you need more time. You've had more than enough time. You've had more time than the statute books actually allowed you to have. And now it's these people's day and they need justice and, you know, I suppose some form of, of, of assistance for the damage that was done. So I'm appealing to people here for that and I'm particularly uh, appealing to you to make sure that Karen Nua gets the message loud and clear that some of the behaviour that has been uh, underway over the past period will from today stop and not afflict these people any further. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you.